Hi everyone and welcome to our fourth episode of Failure Friday where we talk to my friends, family, business owners, clients about how they have failed forward in their life. Probably one of the few podcasts on social media where we're going to talk about the shitty things we've been through and how we have improved from them and not just our stupendous moments that we like to put forward just like Lee and I were talking about. Without further ado, today we are talking to Lee Decarenas. He's one of my favorite clients. He has a great personality and I'm sure he's gonna be an amazing storyteller today. Lee, do you wanna take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, uh, I'm Lee Decarenas. Uh, I hail from the great north of uh, Massachusetts and Philadelphia till I was about 10 years old and then moved to Florida. So I call myself a Floridian now. I've spent most of my life down here. Uh, married, have kids from different spouses because of the mistakes I've made uh, over time, but uh, with, uh, with different life choices. But I'm very happily married, have a wonderful family uh, who's a driving force in my life. And um, I, I feel blessed to be where I am today. Yeah, Holly is his wife and she is the S-H-I-T. She wears the coolest dresses to work in all of our appointments. She's like something straight out of the 60s. But she's not with us tonight. Maybe another one with Holly would be cool too. That would be she'll cool. do it. That would be cool. She doesn't <laughs> fail a lot other than, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, I was just thinking that as I said that. Like I feel like her failures would be really boring. Yeah, no, she, she would come up with them, but I think, you know, they're all relative, right? So your failure might not be as monumental in your own mind as someone else's. So it's all relative, like you said. Agreed. Yeah. Well, let's jump right into it. Um, I always like to ask what career you're in and why you chose it, even if it's not, if you don't choose to take your failure from your career, or rather your personal life. But your career is actually very interesting and it's very popular where we are from in Jacksonville military city so tell us a little bit about that okay um my primary career i joined the the u.s navy um not quite straight out of high school i spent uh, a year in college and then went into the navy um did a did a little over 15 years uh spent time in the submarine force i was a missile technician so I worked on ballistic missile submarines and worked actually on the missiles themselves. So I had grown a technical background as far as that goes, which is a lot of everything. You, you do electronics, you do uh, pneumatic systems, mechanical systems, you do a lot of research, you do a lot of different things. So when I got out of the Navy, and we'll talk about all the processes that got me out of the Navy and through to where I have ultimately studied, um, I learned along the way that one of the attributes I had that seemed to be successful for me was how I dealt with people. Because um, ultimately, to be successful in the military, that's what you have to be able to do is deal with people on a regular basis. So um, I did that and Again, post-Navy, post-career of naval career um, and all the adversity that led up to going back to school, I decided to go into marketing based on that background of being able to communicate with people and uh, making sure that I could get to an understanding of different customers and things like that to be able to um, understand their needs and match a product with their needs. In doing that, I kind of discovered that I liked more of the analytical side too, so um, I became a number cruncher. You are definitely we, an analytical thinker if I've ever yes. met one. Yes, um, so I kind of used the knowledge I met, or the knowledge I gained from uh, people uh, interaction and kind of applied that to numbers to see, okay, what makes people tick, why do they? purchase certain products, what makes certain products attractive more than others. You know, it was a website analysis that I did and a lot of things like that. And I was, I was pretty successful at it, but ultimately, um, family-wise, um, I chose to leave that and uh, support um, the household. And so I, you know, um, su support my wife's decision to continue with her career. I, you know, do everything for the house, you know, kids and 
the housework and all that stuff. And it doesn't sound glamorous, but uh, that is what I do now, knowing that I can do all those little pieces along the way. And actually, those skills have become very invaluable now because I have to deal with so many different things with, you know, maintaining the house, the appointments, you know, all these other things that before I didn't really have any interaction with at all. So I will say that this has been probably one of the most challenging of jobs uh, I've dealt with um, throughout my, my working career, as you would say. Um, and that's where I am now. I'm really happy that you said that because it, a lot of people might not realize this, but it is so much more common today for the man to say, I actually have several clients where the man is the homemaker. And I mean, contrary to what I think a lot of women would think, they thrive in that. I mean, it might take some getting used to at first, but you guys thrive in that role, especially someone who's good with multitasking. I mean, you send me, you're one of the few clients I have that send me spreadsheets before our meetings. So those just seem so organized. I can only imagine what your household looks like. Yeah, I but try not it, to keep it crazy though. <laughs> it's not crazy. It, it helps me get my thoughts together. I look forward to your spreadsheet because then I don't have to create my own. I just go off of yours. You're one, might be the only person who does that before every appointment, which I'm thankful for. But let's kind of switch uh, maybe even rewind a little bit. Talk about a momentous failure in your career, whether it's the marketing or the military, and what was your initial reaction to that failure? So um, I spent 15 years in the Navy, as I said before. I was very fortunate enough to move through the ranks rather rapidly. Um, I entered the Navy in 1996, and was an E2 and when I left I was an E8 senior chief petty officer which most people do not attain in a 20-year career and I did that in about 14 years. Quickly explain, explain the rent, the ranks because I don't think a lot, a lot of people know that. What that okay is. well first of all the Navy is completely different than all the other services that have the exact same name so that's part of the problem there mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. or the exact same structure but anyway um you basically have um, the seamen, so that is E1, E2, E3, right? You have a, a, they're like the lower learning class on the ship. And I don't mean lower like, you know, as, as people, but they Quite are the most is. inexperienced. Yeah. They're the most inexperienced. Okay, so they get the grunt work and kind of that stuff. Then the next tier you have is the E4, 5, and 6. And I say 6 with a little bit of hesitation because they are the senior of the E4s and E5s. And they're all called petty officers. And um, they're more of your middle class uh, workers, okay? They're the ones really doing the day in, day out. Um, the first classes really are the, the leaders of, of the division as far as getting the maintenance done, setting schedules with the individual sailors, making sure that. It's a huge leap forward when you become a chief petty officer, which is an E7. And I say that because now you are in upper management, basically. All right. So. Uh, and I became a senior chief, so I was on top of that. So I led uh, a department of sailors rather than the division of sailors that the chief petty officer handles. So I was in charge of, of people across not just my um, job as a missile technician, but now I'm in charge of people in the weapon system, period, as for, you know, torpedo men. Um, different different aspects of that so and that took 14 years 14 years and uh, there it, and like I said typically that's that's a very that's a very hard thing to attain because there is no limit on the number of first-class petty officers there can be in the Navy there you can make it to first class as long as you make it to first class you're golden you'll retire at 20 there are only 7% of the United States Navy that can be a chief petty officer. Wow. So that is limited by Congress. <laughs> so to so make it you're to, expensive at that point, you're expensive. And then to make it to senior chief, um, it's another slice of the pie. Um, and then to make it to master chief, there's only 1% of the United States Navy that is a master chief. 
So as the progression goes and you get to chief, now you're in more of an elite type position because there can only be so many of you. It's not just a sim simple progression where you just have to take tests and pass the um, physical readiness tests and things like that. Do you so. think your rank made your failure that you're about to tell us about more traumatic? Absolutely. Absolutely. And wait, I don't even want to say it was the rank. I mean, that is true because... It's part of it, right? Yeah, because of the uniform, right? The rank's kind of like a uniform, but it's really because of Ooh, I like the that. leadership. Rank is kind of like a uniform. Because it is, rank, right? It's how right. people perceive you. It's how you're perceived. But the... I'm the actual the actual the actual perception of failure to me was how I was the the change in the sailors around me how I made my friends and counterparts feel as a result of my inabilities to do my job properly at that point because it's all about trust the military is all about trust and respect and once you're you lose that trust and respect, it doesn't matter if you're an E4, an E1, E9, Captain 05, it does not matter. At that point, um, Captain 06, sorry. Um, it does not matter once you've lost that trust at any level, that is where the most pain comes from. At least it did for me. So, um, you know, you make mistakes when when you're you know going through but once you make a catastrophic mistake it, it really hurts so tell us about that speak to it so um i i uh i became a chief petty officer um on the cusp of a couple different things in my life going on all at the same time um my mother passed away who i was very close to about uh one week before i found out I made chief petty officer which was then one week before I found out I was going to Kuwait um, for an individual augmentee operation even though I was in submarines I got chosen to go to Kuwait to do an army job for a year that's totally confusing I know but yeah. um I all in this happened Yes, uh, it was kind of a draft within the active duty military during uh, Iraqi freedom and uh, Afghan freedom wars because there was so many jobs to do. The army couldn't fulfill all the jobs that were their responsibility. Wow. So they had to take people from other services um, involuntarily and have them go do these other jobs. I was chosen um, to go do that um, so I left the submarine world for a year and went and did that over in the Middle East. Totally new experience. And as I was going through my chief initiation, I was going through it away from everything else I was used to, which was the sailors on submarines and, and every, every component that I was used to, to a completely different kind of sailors out on the West Coast who are Seabees, who are construction sailors. They do stuff on land and they're basically building bridges and, and different things on the base and things like that. So that was traumatic in itself. My mother passing was traumatic and now I'm going to be away from my family for an entire year in the desert where I've never been. Um, and that was kind of the start of the end. So after all of that, that was uh, 2008 through the end of 2009. Oh, I then a terrible got, time, <laughs> just in general. So I and, I and I did fine. I mean, I obviously I made E8 after that, senior chief. Um, you know, it, it was just it was really hard. It was a hardship not on me, but a hardship on my family, of course, uh, at the time. So I got stationed when I came back. I got stationed on another submarine, the USS Georgia, out of Kings Bay, Georgia, and um, now I was a new chief. Um, in charge of, you know, sailors, uh, again, on the submarine, um, and did pretty well for the first couple months. Um, and, uh, just about, just about six or seven months through, um, our submarine broke down and we had to go into dry dock, which is kind of where they fix things They take the submarine out of the water. They fix a bunch of stuff and it is horrible days. Um, 
It's like being at sea. Being at sea is actually better because you're deployed and your family knows you're deployed and there's a mental kind of process that goes with that. Security, where at, yeah. Well, whereas when you're home on in that type of environment, you're working 14, 15, 16 hour days and that's the days you don't have duty where you have to stay on the submarine. So you're home, you, it's, it's almost worse because you're like an absentee parent that's just coming home for a couple hours, eating, sleeping, putting a uniform on, going back to work. So your kids are kind of confused. It's a very confusing time for them. And it can be very trying for, for you know, for a spouse for marriage, and a husband. Yeah. Yeah. So um, shortly after that, we finally got the submarine fixed. We deployed and um, some things were going on back home that were devastating to me. I'm not going to, you know, don't want to talk bad about anything, but uh, it really, it really, it, I just, it, having gone through what I had gone through for the last two years, um, it just, it tore me apart and it just made me go absolutely berserk in my own head. And I spent several days like not eating, not sleeping, just, you know, going through craziness. Um, so eventually, the submarine, you know, you know, people in the submarine could tell I was having issues, and I was taken aside and talked to the medical, uh, the medical doc on board, and he said, "Hey, we've got to get you out of here, and you've got to go see what kind of problems you have." <laughs> so, so, which aspect of that do you perceive as failure? Because as someone looking in, it seems just like the perfect cocktail of disaster. But certainly, you wouldn't be talking about it if there was not an aspect of it that yeah. you feel was failure. The failure came after I got through all that and sent back to Kings Bay, Georgia. Um, Cause I was out at sea and we were off the coast of Key West. Um, when I got back to Kings Bay, Georgia, all that family stuff was of course going on. Um, and I was left alone for a long time with my own thoughts. The wife was gone, the kids were there. It was, so I made, a, I made some bad choices. I made some bad choices that it, in, it, you wouldn't get in trouble for in the civilian world, but you will get in trouble for in the military. Uh, infidelity, um, you know, missing, missing duty. You get in trouble like in that. the military for infidelity? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yes, that's in the you know that's in the uniform code of military justice. I don't think everyone knows that. How do I not know that? I don't know, but yes. <laughs> but you, yeah. you as being a part of the military, not your spouse. Correct. Because Correct. infidelity is for those of for those of you who are not married or around married people, it is runs rampant in the marriage world. So that's why my mind is just blown. And, and within the military community, specifically spouses that are left alone for a long time during deployment and things like that, very common. But yeah, this applies to you. I was I was lonely. I was confused. I was drinking alcohol, which I didn't really do anyway. So okay, well, as I take a sip of my tequila orange juice. No, you're fine. Timing. I just I just had a sip of my my mio in water. So, <laughs> but um, but no, it was a it was a confusing time for me, and unfortunately, it was a confusing time for my children who were there with me, um, with mom being gone and things like that. So I just I was trying to do anything to kind of numb the own pain I was going through. However, unfortunately, that, you know, completely affects your military, um, your military life uh, when it comes to Well, work. how did the military find out? Did you tell them? No. <laughs> it, uh, my, my wife did. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So, okay. and, and, you know, once you do that, they started like, you know, tracing me where I was, they had somebody follow me to somebody's house at oh, night wow. and things like that. Yeah, it, it becomes sneaky. So what was your reaction to the point at which you made a decision to get help? What was your, obviously your initial reaction to what was going on around you was you made a bad decision. But well, at what point I had, did you seek help? I had been getting help since I left um, when I got off the boat in Key West. And I got sent up to Kings Bay and I was getting help for a few weeks. Um, In the form and, of therapy? Uh, no, they were just giving me Prozac. Okay. There was, there was no therapy. Um, 
This is also in 2010 and then into 2000, uh, 2011, I'm sorry, at the time. Why and does that matter? Because now we're in 2021. Do you think and, they handle it better now? Um, no, I think the military handles that better now. I was given I was given drugs and sent home. I had there that is how they handled um, problems. They did not. There was of course there's psychiatrists and things like that. That that's not what they did with me. They gave me drugs and sent me home and said behave. That's mm-hmm. that's how they handled that at the time. And of course that wasn't going well. <laughs> obviously, no. and um, and so ultimately. My spouse came back. We got in fights constantly. Um, of course, when she came back, arguing, yelling, blah blah blah, and um, we got in one final fight. And uh, and you know, we both we both got physical with each other. And uh, in the great state of Georgia, you're going to jail. State of Georgia. <laughs> you're going to jail. There, there's just no. And again, too, this was, a, you know, a no explain kind of county. So, um, so I went from being, um, and I made senior chief uh, just before all this had happened. Um, how soon after? So how soon after? Uh, I just, just as I was leaving the submarine, I made senior chief just as I was leaving the submarine. So, and and when I say that, it's because you've actually. You've actually been selected before that ever happens. So, you know, it took, it takes like four or five months for that result to catch up to you. You know, if, if I had been going through that at that time and my, my, you know, the board had met before that time, there's no way I would have become senior chief probably. I still got to some of the, the, you know, the things to do once I was on shore that I wasn't on the submarine anymore when I was on shore duty. I still got to do things as a senior chief, but um, you know, I, I and that's only because I had made it so quickly, and it, it takes a while to catch up to you in the Navy before you're putting it on and, and starting doing those jobs. But um, the fall, so so I went from being on the submarine, having gone through quite a bit. Uh, 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 quite a bit of adversity in about 14 months but I made it through that and you know still doing pretty well and then all of a sudden now I'm in jail <laughs> you know yeah I've, that is a I've, turnaround I've I've caused all these problems I'm in jail um, and uh, you know when I left I was there for two days don't recommend it anybody don't go to jail if you can avoid it it's not fun it was probably the longest 48 hours of my entire life. Um, and this is coming from someone that, you know, was underwater for three months at any given time <laughs> for 10 different times. I went on 10 deployments uh, under sea. So, um, you know, I, that was such a quick fall. It really was. Oh, and, it, sound, it sounds like it. But while and, in jail, when yes. you're alone with your thoughts, is that when... Is that rock bottom for you? Um, no, no, because I couldn't. The thing is this about, I think rock bottom, you have to be able to understand it. You have to be able to understand when you were at the lowest point. And I knew when I was in jail, I was still, I was still in the Navy. So I didn't know what the future held yet. Um, a few weeks after that, um, I was standing tall before the man and I got kicked out of the Navy. When I got kicked out of the Navy, oh, by the way, when I was on the submarine and deployed that last time, uh, we were, none of the bills were getting paid. Um, my, my spouse at the time knew she was leaving, so she was saving every bit of money she could to eventually go she had power of attorney so anything because you you have to do that when you're on submarines you have to give somebody or your spouse power of attorney because you are unreachable um, during certain parts of your deployment you just are there's there's no way around that so 
they get not uh, not just a you know a specific power of attorney, but a general power of attorney, which is everything. Um, so uh, she basically didn't pay any bills for quite a while. Um, when I was in jail, bank account got emptied, and now I got out of jail. House is foreclosed on. I got kicked out of the Navy, and I'm you know I when I hit. The bottom in Georgia, it was me sitting in a house that had no lights, no water. My four-year-old son, because she only took two of them, she oh, sent wow. she sent the oldest back to his mom because I had been previously married. And she said, well, you take care of Brandon. So I'm sitting in a house with no lights, no water, a four-year-old, and it's a foreclosed house. So eventually they're coming away. And I had just gotten out of the Navy, which was the only thing I had known for a decade and a half. So I don't know how to do things. I don't know how to, you know, set up medical appointments. I don't know how to do anything because I had relied on my spouse to do these things. This is this is, you know, be a follow-on in later in this in this talk that we have on how you need to make sure you keep track of how to do things in your life. <laughs> Whether you're currently doing them or not, you everybody needs to know a certain basic amount of life skills. Um, yes. Because the military oh. doesn't, you don't have to do that. I'm told, I was told when to go to the dentist. I was told when to go to medical. I was told when to do virtually anything that was like an adult, the adult NFL thing. is the same Way. Oh, I'm sure your husband does this. Oh, all the and time. it's not even so. I have I have clients, and when they retire, because I mean they start playing football or or soccer or baseball when they're four, five, six years old, and then when they retire, it's like the weight of the world is now. I don't. I didn't know I had to clean the the uh, lint thing and in, in the drying machine, like these these basic things, and it just makes them constantly. It's like failure after small yeah. failures. The failure yeah. after failure because you, these are things you feel like society tells you you need to know but you never learn from them yeah i imagine that was really hard it was hard um i had a then i had a friend in colorado um where i had visited twice in my life and again i'm in a fog i don't know what to do so i'm like i had very little money I actually had friends that were lending me money and I said, well, let me take Brandon and let's go to Colorado and I'll stay with a friend out there. I just need a change of pace. <sighs> Went to Colorado with everything I could possibly pack in my truck, which meant I'd left a lot of things behind in the house because I could only pack what I could pack and drove to Colorado, 1800 miles. It's a long drive. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, got there and the friend I thought was going to stay with was like not really willing to let me stay so now huh. I'm in a completely different environment I end up staying at a Motel 6 every night with my son who I now have to ro enroll in school so I had to enroll him in school in kindergarten while we were technically homeless, homeless. And so I only had enough money to stay at that Motel 6. You know, I was you know, scraping to get by. I was able to finally get SNAP benefits, EBT card, when I was in Colorado. So we were able to eat meagerly. Um, and my friend's money ran out. I had no contact with my family. Nobody knew what was going on. And, um, and I, was dire, I was just in dire straits. And um, this is like, I'm on the brink of tears right now, just knowing where you are right now because I manage your money and where you, where you yeah. were when you're talking. I mean, you have come so far, Lee. And that's why I know people can, can do a lot more than they think they may be able to. And that's because, now don't get me wrong, a lot of good luck um, comes along with adversity. Um, and when I say that, it doesn't mean that it got any easier. It just means you made the right choices at the right time. Um, so we're, we're basically staying at this Motel 6. I contact Brandon's mother and I say, look, I, he can't stay here. It would, there's just no way. It, the, the, you know, uh, he's got to go back with you because things are bad. She came there, she got him and left. 
I couldn't afford to stay in the motel anymore, so I was stayed in my truck for two weeks. I was staying in my truck. And this is where I talk about luck. I have an aunt who heard her husband, this is how crazy this is. I have an aunt who heard her husband go to every state, we're going to every state in, um, in uh, the United States and doing some kind of like half marathon walk. That's just what they do. I hadn't contacted my family in forever, mind you, because I didn't want them to know what was going over with me. I had my cell phone, but I like, you know, we don't talk like on the normal, really. So it wasn't out, out of the ordinary for them not to hear from me. I may have texted them once or twice and said, hey, what's up? Doing fine, whatever. But that was complete bullshit. Um, so I'm in a Waffle House eating like hash browns like that. That's all no, I could afford. Right now. And I'm in Colorado Springs. My aunt happens to text me. This is how by chance this is and says, hey, how are you doing? And I just happened to say, hey, doing all right. Just wanted to let you know I moved to Colorado. And she said, oh, what part of Colorado? And I said, Colorado Springs. And she said, well, we're there right now. That's our 50th state. We hadn't walked any of the other states, but there isn't that odd. And 15 minutes later, because of where they were at, they showed up to the same Waffle House to say hi to me. They had no idea what I was going through. You know, I'm sitting there in clothes, eating, and they walk in and I give them hugs and everything. And um, if they didn't walk in there, if they weren't there and we didn't have that conversation, I would probably either be living under an overpass, begging for money, or not here. Wow. And as crazy as that sounds, it is just unbelievable. It doesn't now, sound crazy. So uh, they lent me a hundred bucks because you know they are not well to do, but they took all of their money to get there, and um, it was enough money for me to drive all the way back to the East Coast where at least I knew things. And um, I was lucky enough to get back. I found a roommate, a lady who lived at the beach in Ponte Vedra Beach, who off Craigslist, who said, yeah, you can stay with me and <laughs> let me rent a room from her. I got a job at a plumbing company here in town, uh, David Gray Plumbing. I was a dispatcher. You know, dispatch a plumber. So now I've got a thirteen hour, a thirteen dollar an hour job. I've got a place to stay. I like. It just started, you know, from there and started coming back. I started paying what little How debts. How old are I you? Uh, right now? No, no, no. At this. Point. At the time, I'm thirty six. All right. Now, how old are you now? Forty five. How old were you when life this took this dramatic turn for the worst? Uh, I was 30, I was 35. Oh, wow. So this is all over a year. Oh, yeah. Going from the Navy into like mm -hmm. poverty okay. in Precipice. Colorado Springs. Yes. It's rough. Yeah. That's, that's how fast that happened. Wow. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it wasn't, a, a, it wasn't necessarily a slow decline. It was fast. It was real fast. I mean, you know, it might not be fast to some people to say, well, you went from a year, you know, being the cream of the crop in the United States Navy for, to, to, you know, living on the streets with no job. <laughs> but, um, you know, the fact that it, it did take a long time to get where I am now. Oh, Through yeah. I mean, I'm just astonished because I've never, we've had some deep conversations and we, we have never crossed this one. No. Um, but I, I feel I, like I, I wish we would have because, I mean, I've I, been at, at the bottom and, and lost a lot of, maybe not financially, but I, I lost a lot of who I was. So a lot of the things you're talking about, I can, I too was once in a Waffle House contemplating suicide in Tallahassee, Florida. And I mean, the turnaround from that point, and I'm sure everyone has an experience, maybe not as terrible as the one we're talking about right now, but... 
everyone has an experience where they have to pick themselves, they have to make a decision whether they pick themselves up and rebuild or they don't. Right. And I mean, just knowing where you are right now is just cra crazy yeah. that from what you're talking about to, to where you are today. But going to the next point, which you touched on briefly, but I do want you to revisit that. What are some specific takeaways someone could learn from your failure? Because what you're going through, maybe not the exact situation, but the place of having to rebuild everything or especially everything with the child. Um, I, I'm sure there's plenty of people that will see this and be like, I've been there or I'm there. I think, uh, I think, well, there's kind of two questions in there. And the first one I think was kind of like, how do you, how do you pick yourself back up or how do you avoid maybe that getting that deep in the failure? Mm -hmm. And I think you always need to have some kind of pulse. And this is what I lost on who you are on a regular basis. When I was, when I was in the Navy, and I was working, I was working my ass off, but I was petty officer or chief petty officer de Cardenas. Even, even people who were in the Navy with me, when they see you out in town, they call you by your last name. <laughs> they don't call you by your normal name. And in fact, my last name was so damn hard to pronounce. Not only did you screw it up in the beginning, but no one else in the Navy knew how to say it. So they called me d -car. That's all anybody ever called me. And here's the problem with that. That's like an alter ego. That's like a superhero kind of mentality, right? So when you're that other person constantly, you completely forget, at least I did, I completely forgot what was important to me, where I came from, as far as you know, younger getting into the, the Navy. I really didn't remember to hold on to who I was prior to that. And in doing that, I'm not saying you can't grow from what you are when you're young, but those experiences that you have when you're young are important. And I just shed all of that from my life and became a sailor and didn't pay attention to the values that kind of got me to the start of being a sailor. Um, you know, when you were in that Waffle House, you know, um, and going through that stuff, you know, I, I, I wondered if you had a lot of adversity, you had a lot of problems at that moment, but if you look back to a certain time frame before all the horribleness that got you, I don't know if there was, but there may have been a point where things were okay with you, at least, you know, um, oh, yeah. with your family, with your mental state, with, with different things that were going on with you. And that's what I think is important is whatever adversity you're going through, try to remember the time in your life when you were cared about, you cared about things, um, the future had hope. Um, because if you lose that hope and you forget that it, that there's a possible, um, better future, um, it's it's really hard to pull yourself out of that. It really is, and and it's gonna it's going to allow you to suck your to to keep you down in the failure that you've got buried in, and and you'll you're not gonna you're gonna not come out of it, and you're going to make even worse choices. I think as a result. So to to the audience, uh, what he's talking about is actually a tool called visualization visualization. And that's where you visualize something over and over and over again. And it trains your brain to revisit. And you have to be really intentional when you do it. You think about how you feel. You think about, uh, like if, in your visualization, if there's a table, you touch the table. You create this vision that you can revisit to and use as a tool when you're in periods of just total depression. I still use it today. I have a specific memory where I can still close my eyes at any given moment and I can visualize myself at this place. I can touch the things around me. I can feel the feelings. And then this sounds crazy, but it is a tool you can use. One, if you suffer from depression, bipolar, it's a tool you can use if you, even if you don't, and you're in a spot where 
you're going towards a situation that Lee and I are talking about. Visualization is so powerful. Athletes use it all the time. It's um, definitely an important tool to get you out of shitty, just an overall shitty time. Yeah. Um, no, that sounds like what you're talking about. It is, it is. And it's just like, um, intentionally doing it's important. And everybody in the world, there's an involuntary thing, right? If you smell something when, mm -hmm. you know, that reminds you, it's a reminiscent kind of thing. And this, this is the same kind of thing, except you're intentionally doing it to bring yourself to a good place. Yep. And, or, you know, or whatever place you need to be in. And I think that's that's really smart. That's really good information for everyone to hear. Yes, that. And I also have a happy box where it's a, literally a physical box and in it are just things that make me happy. It was when I first started practicing my, this visualization exercise we're talking about and I would touch things and smell things to get me to that place. Highly recommend it. It's called a happy box. Create one. Can I send you something for box. your Can I send you something for your happy box? You can, <laughs> but it has to genuinely make me happy. I I know. I know. It wouldn't be something. It wouldn't be something out of out of character or anything, but But it, it does work really good. It's also a really good thing to do with kids, but neither yeah. here nor there. Yeah. Um how has failure shaped your personal life? I mean, we this was kind of like a career slash personal failure. You kind of were able to merge everything together but how did that failure shape you as a person today how did you fail forward from it so the biggest thing i can say is um i definitely again figured out what was important to me in my life and um be able to share that with the important people in my life once i was able to once i was able to center myself and realize that I had a future and I can be something and I can share that with you know my children with others around me I, I thought that um, it really would help me understand that moving forward I could improve each and every day and that's what I've tried to do since being at my lowest points. I've tried to improve each and every day and remember how special each day is. Because like you, I didn't know how many days I had left. You know, and once you get to that point and we're fortunate enough, we came snapped out of that funk and, you know, became successful and or not successful but we, we we achieved what we wanted to achieve going forward um, it's all about surrounding your own self with positivity and that can come from within it can come from outside but recognizing where's the bad place to go and not going there right. just like you said about the the table and touching it and things like that that kind of gets you back to where you belong or to help you through a difficult situation same kind of thing just every every instance of that i would you know pretend it's fire and not touch it yeah not to be i want there's two things i want to talk about before okay we conclude and that was one waffle house is awesome it has absolutely no no absolutely i mean I the hurricane the hurricane thing i mean think about it it's unless it's a cat five they're open <laughs> I know. I love them, even though it's the place I went literally before I, well, before I was like thinking about committing suicide. Um, I still go there at least twice a month. Great food, fresh. I mean, you see them make it. Whatever. Oh yeah. I just want to touch on that because I feel like correlation is not causation. Waffle House did not make me suicidal. Um, but we talked about medicine, and I totally not against people being medicated, taking antidepressants or any type, anything to help them get through something, but I'm a firm believer, not a doctor, had to say that, not anything close to that. Um, medicine is not going to fix the problem. It is useless, maybe not useless. It is, you have to combine medicine with action, a behavior change. Otherwise, you're gonna be right back in that Waffle House. 
I've seen it so many times. I mean, Lee, can you speak to that? It's not, it's a Band-Aid. I um, can. So, so, so I'll tell you, I do take prescription medication every day um, from my doctor. However, just like you said, it's a tool. It is not the vehicle. So it's got to be a combination of many different factors. Now, there's some people can can do without it. There's some people that, that absolutely must have it. Um, the psycho, the, the, uh, the, uh, the drugs that I take, the psychotropic drugs that I take, they're cumulative, right? So you can't just like start them and stop them. Like they're going to kind of mess you up if you do that. Um, there's been like a couple times where I'm like, oh, I forgot my medication. You know, I got to take it. And, and there's a difference. You can kind of feel, at least me, I can kind of feel that difference. It's not, you know, it's not going haywire, but it's a, you know, it's a feeling you have. Um, but at the same oh, time, but at the same time, you're absolutely right. Um, it took a lot and it took a long time for that, for my um, psychiatrist to find the right thing. Cause it, some things affects one person one way, some people get affected the other way. You know, some people can take completely different subject, you know, melatonin. You can take melatonin at night before you go to sleep. It's not gonna really hurt you if you take a bunch of melatonin. Doctors have said that, but you shouldn't do it, right? You should just get natural sleep. You should you not mess with your circadian rhythms and just go to sleep. So, um, it's a tool and I think it's okay so long as it's not a crutch and it's the on, not the only thing you rely on. You need to have a healthy diet. You can't drink alcohol if, you know, in excess. You shouldn't be doing drugs. There's, there's a number of, of things that perhaps the person that's not got um, problems per se. And I, I re I'm a firm believer, honestly, Kendall, that everybody on some level has the same issues that I have. Or, or anybody else. I have a child who has autism. And um, I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm, we're blessed to have him um, because you learn so much, not only from your kids. When you have kids, you learn so much. I know you as a mother now are, are, are 30% smarter than you were before you were a mom. And that doesn't mean you were oh, done yeah. before, but you know so much more about it life. It opens up a part of your brain you don't have access to until you have kids. Right, right. And so, and then having a special needs kid, there is another thing that kind of opens up in you just to kind of understand. And I'm here to tell you, just because I've seen him and I've seen other kids that, that, that have, the, have the same label, let's say, um, ev everybody has autism. <laughs> everybody on some to level. To an extent. I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example. Kids with autism do something called stemming. Stemming is kind of a response to calm themselves. Some kids, it's very extreme. Um, you know, they'll start banging on a wall or they'll start pounding on their desk or something like that. And it's not them being rambunctious. It's just their way of coping with things. And um, I'm like, wow, okay. And then the same doctor said, well, here is an example of why everybody stems. If you take your pencil and you just kind of like tap it back and forth on your desk while you're taking a test, like involuntarily, you've probably seen people do that, like in school, just tapping their well, pencil people back who and shake forth. their legs. My husband or has this. That's exactly terrible what that is. Terrible habit. It drives me crazy. It's stemming. That is called stem. It's the same exact thing, and it's a comfort. It's not, it's not something weird. It's not meant to be something that's unusual or <laughs> a pet peeve pissing you off. It's just a, uh, a comforting kind of emotion that you're going through. And so many people do that who don't have autism. It's just, it's just a component of what they do. So it's really fascinating. Evan spins around. This is, he does it exactly. He spins around counterclockwise and looks at his right wrist. Wow. He'll do, and it's the exact same thing every time. He doesn't spin clockwise. He always spins counterclockwise. He never looks at his left wrist. He only looks at his right wrist. And he'll just do that at random, and he'll do it for about 15 to 30 seconds, and then just completely stop and go back to what he was doing. Very strange. That's fascinating. I mean, that, I mean, we could have a whole episode on autism, to be honest, because it is just... 
it, yeah. some of the things that I've heard from other clients, it's a lot, I have several clients that have autistic children. Like the things that they have learned from that experience, it's just, you would never, there was no reason if your child was not autistic for you to ever know these things, but it's a whole world of knowledge and a lot of it's rooted in just basic human behavior. You yeah. learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. It just pushes what you speak to. But yeah. thank you so much for sharing this story with us. I no definitely problem. think there's just so many lessons embedded in there. I feel like we could talk for hours about that because yours was truly intertwined personally and professionally. And I can't wait to see some of the feedback I get from this episode. Um, but with that, I'm going to end today's Failure Friday. I'm so thankful, Lee, that you joined me in our fourth episode. If anybody else would like to sign up to be on an episode, now you have to be interesting. Uh, you have to be a good speaker. And um, we're booked until I think it's March of next year. But let me know and I'll send you the link. If you have any feedback or if you would like to speak with Lee, Lee, where can people reach you or would you prefer not to be reached? Um, I could be reached. Uh, probably the easiest thing would be to email me. Uh, okay. It would be at my last name, uh, D Cardenas, D E C A R D E N A S L at yahoo.com. Um, and so uh, if you, if you write me, I will. Screen. Yeah, if you write me, I will write back. Um, just because this has been great. You know, I've told this story to very few people, and the fact that this is going to reach a lot of people, specifically ones I don't know. And I think that makes it even more poignant because when you hear a story from someone you do not know, um, I think a lot of times you take a little bit more, you take a little bit more of it in just because it's like, okay, there's somebody out there that, that I don't know who's been through all this adversity. Um, how about the people I do know? Should I reach out to them, find out what they've been through? Yes. You know? so. oh, I love that because that's exactly why I did this. This was a great, this was a part of my childhood that I didn't realize was, had such an amazing effect on me until I became an adult. And I was like, wow, nobody talks about how screwed up they are and how that has actually made them such a more fascinating person, a better business owner, a better mother, father. I mean, we should be talking about this. And I think that, like you said, when you don't know the person, your biases aren't going to affect how you take in that information as much. And that's why I, I really want to encourage people, if you're not comfortable reaching out to Lee, you can reach out to me and I will ask him questions and give them back to you. But I thank you for coming on my platform and opening up your book, Lee, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Kendall. And thank you to everybody uh, who took the time to watch this. I really appreciate it. All right, good night, Lee. Good night, thank you.